good. Super excited about this. Um, in addition to what we talked about yesterday, Austin, I had a couple more ideas. I actually would love to read a little bit of an excerpt from what you wrote. Okay. If you're okay with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, back to meeting. I have you. Let me make sure I have your writing up as well. Um, By the way, you've changed the signature, is it? You've gone from Urban Sadhu to Urban Guru? Is it say Guru? It should just say Sadhu. Uh, well, when you wrote in that one, I was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> what do you, no, no, no. Is, it, is, it, is there a, uh, may, it may have been a mis, uh, typo mistake. I don't, it's, it may have changed it on me. I think that, oh, I know I changed it on the last copy. I saw it. I saw it and on the first one, That's and then easy. I changed it. I, there was an edit. There were a couple of edits that I made, just so you know. Like I saw that maybe it was like just going through and autocorrect. You know what I mean? One was yeah. um, that, and the other one was uh, the word uh, Brahman instead of Brahma. Oh, 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 got it. Like I do see here in the one that you forwarded to me, let me just share my screen. Um, oh, you've disabled screen sharing. Do you see at the bottom the share screen? Yeah. Can you just enable multiple participants? Hold on, what do I do? What do you want? So at the bottom icon, do you see share screen? Share screen. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, just click on that and you should see multiple participants or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to click on the document? Uh, you know, actually, if you want to allow me to share a screen, I can show you what I was referring to. Okay. So if you enable multiple participants to share a screen, it'll allow me to. Multiple participants can share a screen, okay. There you go, let's see. Oh, there you are. So I wanna show you. Now, click out this. Do you see here? Yeah, that got changed. Awesome. So I wanna read from, I think that there's parts of this that I actually did wanna read as we were talking. If so the other okay. thing that got changed is I changed um, Sharon's interpretation. I changed a couple of words of, so that I didn't have to credit them in the new chant book. <laughs> got it. And then- I have to remember, I have to remember to call it exploration of the month and I shouldn't forget. So I will make a note. And then the other thing I changed was, um, it doesn't, I mean, unless you're going to read the sentence at the bottom where it says, David and Sharon teach us at Jiva Mukti, right? Yeah. I changed that to something like, you know, they make a statement in their book, uh, Jiva Mukti Yoga Practices for Liberation. Yeah. Instead of, I, so I kind of changed the phrasing of that so it wasn't like it was a Jiva Mukti institution. Got it. I so left I, their name there. I left their I, name in the book. Okay. I gave them credit. Got it. So my goal was actually to start out by saying, Austin, I love the exploration for this month. And your title was the loudest sound can be heard in an empty vessel. It yeah. evoked so much for me. So why don't you start out with what inspired you to write this? Is that okay with you? Yes. And that to me is a good segue then into going to all the questions we talked about yesterday, which was, what is nada? Um, and then I was going to ask you and ask you to double click on this whole concept of the struck versus the unstruck sound. So again, we are just deconstructing into everyday language. Well, that will be kind of like in, in terms of like what inspired me to write this is, is that. Yeah, if you already captured that, then it's fine. I want to ask you the same question. Right. And then I was going to ask you about tuning into the inner year, starting with how can you tune into the inner year on the mat? Right. Okay. And so we could go from there. What do you say? That sounds good. 
Okay, let me just stop sharing. I'm gonna have it open for me. Let me just click out of all these other things. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Uh, does Bobby, I mean, sorry, not does Bobby, you're already recording, awesome, okay. Yeah, you can edit it. Hello, Austin. Hello, Nurupa, how are you? I'm good. I'm excited to be doing this. Uh, I am too. I thought our last month's um, discussion was very successful. I'm happy that you felt that way. And also, you know why I'm excited? Because I'm going to the motherland tomorrow. Yes, you're going to India. Yeah. Wow. You're yeah. going to for like a two months almost? Uh, almost, yeah. April 20th, I'm back. And we're going to have to do our next April exploration of the month from me from India. That'll be, that'll be interesting, right? Like the, the internet connection and everything <laughs> globally. Yeah, so we'll see. I will say that even within my own home, I sometimes don't have good Wi-Fi, so. Yeah, I don't either here. So same thing here. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, so I wanted to, if I loved the exploration of this month. Oh, thank and, you. Thank you. Yeah, you wrote in your newsletter to us you started with the loudest sound can be heard in an empty vessel. Yeah. Which I thought was profound. I mean, and I wanted to hear a little bit more as to what was the inspiration behind this exploration of the month. Why did you write this? So I wrote this, I wrote this a number of years ago um, when I was still uh, with uh, the Jiva Mukti brand. Um, and they had asked us to, write and submit um, focuses of the month. They have focuses of the month. We have explorations of the month. Uh, and I think the term there is a little different. When you focus on it, it's kind of like the person who's writing is telling you what to focus on, whereas an exploration opens up the subject for people to find, discover things on their own. So that becomes very different, uh, exploration and focusing. Um, but I noticed one of the things is I started to, as I continued my practice outside of the Jiva Mukti method, I started practicing with my, uh, guru now, uh, Sudarshan, who is in India and he's a big, in yes, in so, uh, uh, Sudarshan Ji is very like not a yoga practitioner and he's he's in he's really deeply uh, part of the practice is the idea of sound vibration and hearing sound vibration within yourself and connecting to that in deep meditation. Um, Nada yoga was a part of the Jiva Mukti method but over time, what I had noticed is Nada had started to be interpreted as music. And it became an excuse for teachers to play music in class that probably was inappropriate music. You know, everything from like techno to hip hop to Madonna. I mean, it was, it was, it was the, the interpretation kept being slanted to include pop culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that something that was, very, that was very deep and profound was being lost in the desire to uh, be inclusive in a yoga class through the use of popular music. Mm. I have a couple of questions on that. This is very helpful. Thank you for explaining. So both of us have experienced Ashtanga yoga in some form or the other. And for about a year and a half, I trained under, under the Mysore practice. And um, the, there was no music. And in fact, you had to, this was a deliberate practice of tuning into the metronome of your breath. And because it was a Mysore self-led style, meaning a teacher wasn't leading me through it, I had to actually come into the symmetry and awareness of my own inhalation and my own exhalation. And the idea was then to get into a state of samasthiti, like where both yes. the inhalation and the exhalation were proportionate and symmetrical. Now, 
I will say this, and you know, I come from India, so I understand the, and I revere the tradition of the way yoga is taught in practices like this. But if you were to put yourself in the shoes of someone that is not, that has to be initiated into this, mm -hmm. you know, and when you're opening the doors to a much broader community of practitioners who may or may not have been trained in this way, could there still be some kind of an in-between then of creating a rhythm and a ritual such that it doesn't become so fundamental from the get-go? I don't know. Am I asking you something controversial here? No, I think, so I, let's just start with like, you know, why um, someone like a tradition like Ashtanga or even Shivananda, they don't play music. I mean, I, I, as I remember, Shivananda doesn't play music. I know for years they didn't, they may now, but for years they didn't. So when we look at um, a text like Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is one of the three major texts on asana and Hatha Yoga, um, when you get to the chapter, which I think is chapter two or three, and um, they speak of ujjayi breath, which is what you were saying, the inhale and the exhale, the, the kind of sound at the back of the throat. Hatha Yoga Pradipika says that that sound that's being made at the back of the throat is the nada, and it is opening up the ida and the pingala so that Kundalini can move fluidly through and you're supposed to, while you're practicing asana or meditation or mudras, practice ujjayi breath because it is the nada. It is the nada, but it's the nada in a kind of gross way. It's not subtle where there's nothingness and emptiness. It's that training the ear to hear the nada, right? So gross being the body. Gross being, gross being still a very phenomenal world, being hearing it in the, the world. So when we talk about music being played in a yoga class, it, it's, it would be wrong for me to say that to train the ear to hear the nada internally, you can't use music. You can. You can use music. You can. There are a whole list of um, sounds, exterior sounds that can help you to understand what you're trying to hear internally. And um, it's everything from the sound of crickets at night to uh, wooden flutes, to drums, to um, the uh, sa sound of mantras being chanted. Um, so, it, 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 but it's pretty, the list is not like forever long and uh, I would say that, you know, a great uh, practitioner who's been studying Nada Yoga for years would definitely say something like, well, you know, all music is not created equally. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's not because the things that I'm advising you are suggesting that you focus on externally to understand the internal sound. These are all sattvic sounds. They're not rajasic or tamasic. They're not low energy. So the quality of the sound that you're focusing on externally is, is really important. Um, David and Sharon, the founders of Jiva Mukti Yoga, they say in uh, you know, their book, uh, Practices for Liberation, they say that they added music to classes to kind of help pump up the classes, to kind of help energize people. So they were the first to add music in a asana class. Before that, it was never done. It was really tabooed, even in Western American yoga, like 60s and 70s, you just didn't have loud music playing in the background. Um, so they did it to, to get people excited. You know, they were starting to play Beatles and, you know, Sting and things that were kind of popular in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And, um, but like as, as time went on, by the time I came around, you know, you would go to a class and you would have a teacher playing kind of techno club music that was like a thump, 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 thump beat and all, all electronics, which um, had no natural sound to it at all. Or it didn't fit the cadence. And I've been in classes like this when it's been really loud. It doesn't fit the cadence of you're not able to get into a rhythm of the breath. 
Right. In the way of the rhythm of the breath. And that has been- It cuts very, across it. You know what I mean? And sometimes yeah. it is so loud that I'm not able to hear my own breath. Or like are, yeah. Or you're not able to hear the nada in sound, inside. That you're not real. This, this, the music is speaking to you completely externally, but not internally. Yeah. Um, I love this. Yeah, I love this. Could I? Would you give me the chance to read from your a few, a few sentences from your beautifully written uh, email or the newsletter? Sure. And um, I would have gone into the Sanskrit, but I think I am actually going to butcher it because uh, I'm going to try it. Um, Anahatasya sabdasya dvanitya upalabhyata dvaner antargatam nyeyam yenasya antargatam mana manastatra. I think it's layam, but I'm not sure. It's written in English. So tad vishno paramam padam. And the meaning you said is one hears the unstruck sound anahata shabdha. The quintessence of the sound is a supreme object. On hearing that, the mind becomes one with that object of knowledge and is dissolved therein. What remains is the Supreme Self. And you credit to Sharon Gannon for this translation. Yeah. I wanted to read this was you explained very beautifully when I was in your Triguna class yesterday on the difference between struck and unstruck sound. Yeah. So would you talk a little bit about that? So a, a struck sound is anything of two objects striking together. So my vocal cords talking or striking together. That is not really the nada, right? It's, it's because it's two things coming together, creating an action that I get that clap or that snap of the finger. Nada exists on a subtle level. So when you read the uh, Sanskrit from Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is, um, let me just look real quick. It's, it's actually chapter four, uh, sutra, uh, sutra number, or sloka number 100. Mm. Uh, it, it, it says Vishnu. So that slight interpretation um, that Sharon did, in reality, the, 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 sut the sloka is saying that the nada is Vishnu. It is Narayani, it is Narayana. It is the, um, the absolute in its primal form, which is very heavy. I mean, this is now getting like really kind of kind of heavy, but it's saying that it's, it's, it's the state of the divine that is beyond the beyond, is what the sloka is trying to say. So if it is a state of of vibrational quality that is beyond the beyond, it can't be made with struck sound. Mm. It exists on a, on, a, on a plane that it, we actually don't even know how to describe it. Um, we don't know how to, to uh, make it. It can't be made. Anything mm. that I make is, is finite, it's not infinite, mm. right? So this is an infinite sound, an infinite vibration. Um, and it's interesting, uh, Sri Ramananda Saraswati, who uh, was also very much into Nada yoga, in his book on Nada yoga, he actually says that, that the ringing in your ear that you, that a lot of people find so annoying and they go to the doctor and they want to to have that removed. He says that is the nada that you're experiencing. I he love said, that. And, he's, and he says, you're so lucky that you're experiencing this sound that's out there that's not even being made by anything that's striking and you don't realize that that's what you should be tapping into. I love it. Can I, can I say something about that? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you mentioned this about Ramananda Maharishi because in 2017 I started getting this increasing escalation of tinnitus in my ear. It wouldn't all, it was one year. I never went to the doctor and I, over time I got used to it. And to this day, I actually know when I tune in, when it happens, it becomes a moment of extreme stillness for me. It's become yeah. a moment of kind of meditation. Yeah. And so it, it was very, it was very interesting when I read what he wrote about that, because he, because he was like, that's what you're too tuning into. That's what you're hearing. You're hearing a frequency. And he even goes on to say that people who hear it 
are on a higher spiritual vibration than people who don't hear it. Mm. They're tapping into something and that you should always be listening for it. So um, that, when I read that in his book, and here again, when I wrote this essay, I was still with the Jiva Mukti brand. I thought, wow, like even though Sri Brahmananda Saraswati was one of the Sapta gurus for Jiva Mukti, this has been lost in translation. And I wanted to write this essay kind of getting back to that idea of like hearing when you are in deep meditation and you're supposed to have shunya or emptiness, that that's when you hear this the loudest. That's when you're able to tune in. Yeah, I love that. Could I could I ask you a very practical, not that this is not practical, but based on what you just described, as a teacher and as a practitioner and as someone that runs uh, a beautiful yoga studio, how do you facilitate your classes in a way where you're trying to bring your students to the state of nada? Like, what do you do? Well, one of the things that I've, I, that, you know, I think I still consider what I'm doing I mean, I consider what I'm doing lineage yoga. I mean, my lineage is comes from Krishnamacharya into Patabi Joyce through Sharon Gannon and David Life. And, you know, part of lineage yoga, you know, Patabi Joyce didn't teach like Krishnamacharya. He was trained under Krishnamacharya and then he created Ashtanga. I view this is what I'm doing. Also, I'm 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 looking at like what was taught, and over time, you can say, well, this is what works, and this is what didn't work. What didn't work within the Jivamukti method uh, was their meditation and how they taught meditation, because what they taught is a a let go mantra that you're inhale thinking to yourself let and exhale to yourself go, which is not really a mantra. It's an affirmation. It's an English affirmation. And um, with Nada being so important to the Jiva Mukti practice, being one of its five tenets, I also started questioning, like, why isn't OM the mantra you're focused on? Why are you not getting people to understand how to meditate and focus on this vibrational sound of OM? So that has switched. I now encourage the, the teachers, you know, we're all, we're all trained by Jiva Mukti to teach meditation from the point of view of hearing Om within the breath, of seeing the symbol of Om in the mind's eye, and trying to just connect to that instead of an English affirmation or even a, a Sanskrit mantra that is not as powerful as own. And we have to, and, and when I say that, I, you know, we have to remember that Om is the original mantra. It was what the uh, Saptarishis heard first in meditation. They, and then they heard the Vedas. And that's what being the seven rishis, the is seven that? original rishis that, that bring us these very esoteric teachings and, um, you know, and who knows how long ago that was. I, I say that's at the beginning of time. Um, but we, so that it's very mystical. But, but the, even in, in the Vedas, it says that that's what the Saptarishis heard first was the pranava, or the, and that's how, it, that's the, the term used to, to describe Om. In, in these ancient texts, it's never written out as, a-U-M or O-M are the symbol that we use all the time. It's, it's the pranava or the, the life force, the life-giving force within the universe. Can, you, can we do something experiential here? So you obviously have trained uh, under an American lineage, but also with deep roots from, the, from an Indian family of yoga, right? But equally, you've, your relationship with Sudarshan Ji, who you mentioned ahead of in the beginning of this conversation has also increased over the last few years. And I've also had the good fortune of seeing him in the studio. Yes. If you had to recite OM the way you were taught. Right. In the American setting versus the way Sudarshan Ji does it, would you want to show us? 
Yeah, so Sudarshan, um, Sudarshan G, uh, so when, um, when he came to the studio, he said, oh, let's all chant Om. And he, he was doing a meditation and everybody chanted Om. And he, he kind of waited a second and he kind of opened his eyes and he said, okay, when you chant Om, <laughs> And, you know, when the Swami says that to you, you know, like when the Swami goes there, you know that you have to stop for a moment and listen. And um, he went through this whole thing about Om and how Om was not this nasal sound that was in the top of the head, but actually had to start from the back of the throat, move to the middle of the palate and then to the front of the mouth. So, you know, and if you've ever taken a Sanskrit class, that's the first thing the Sanskrit teacher starts teaching you is, is the difference between dental and throat sounds. And they go through the whole range of the guttural sounds to the, to the tongue or the th uh, teeth sounds, getting you to understand how to move vibration forward. And so, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was one of those kind of things that you had all of these American practitioners who had been chanting Om every time they come to a asana class. What does the nasal Om sound like? Om. This is right up here. It's right. right? It's and 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 it's very like all of a sudden out there in front of you. Yeah, and now what is what is uh, how would you render this if Sudarshan Ji was, was teaching you and you were sitting in front of you? So if Sudarshan was saying to to do it, he would say he would say it has to start back here at the back of the throat. So he would go, um. So it started with an ah. It went into an. Uh. long it's long and it's also more even like the ah ooh, and mm are given equal vibrational time mm. so it's not oh you know, like, you know <laughs> jamming it all together um uh so that uh that idea that you're moving the vibration from the back of the throat to the front of the, the mouth is, is a very interesting idea because every language that is a vibrational language has ah, ooh, and mm in it. Mm. Clicking languages don't. So that also means that ah, ooh, and mm is creating everything around you. Say that, more, I want to hear more about that. Is this tied back to the creator and the sustainer? And I want to look, what do you mean by that? Well, so, so there's the mythological kind of ideas that we can have to the sound of own that like, you know, uh, which is Puranic teachings, which is, is the universe uttered into the ear of Brahman, the creator deity, the sound of Om, and from Om, he started to create the world around him. From Brahma, right? But if you see that as a metaphor mm. for you experiencing the phenomenal world, every, you know, as a child, you start through ah, oh, and mm, learning to speak and give everything identity and names. You know, mm. a chair becomes chair, uh, uh, a banana becomes a banana. And even in banana, you have all of those sound mm. vibrations happening. So sound vibration gives identity to the world. So OM gives identity to the phenomenal world, but it's also, but it all comes from the esoteric world. From mm. the, from the uh, you know, the idea of the infinity, infinity from infinity comes, comes the finite. Mm. Not the opposite. And ooh and the um, 
like to just kind of extend what you were just saying. So is there a cosmolo is there the Trinity involved in the other two? So, so this, well, well, this is this is where, you know, a lot of uh, that you'll if you like said, OK, I'm going to Google search and see if they're correct. What does all mean? You're going to find, uh, you know, a, you'll find some people who have written up lists that are like, you know, 108 different identities of what all means. Yes, it could be Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, which is is creation, substantiation, and destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, you also find that it's it it is um, the states of consciousness, waking state, dream state, deep sleep, mm. samadhi, that silence in between each own. Um, you also have people say that it means uh, red, white, and black, like like being red, white, and black being the colors of the gunas, mm. tamasic, rajasic, and sattvic. Mm. I love that. Could I, um, I, have t- I, um, I have two questions, two more questions on what you wrote in the, in the exploration of your newsletter. And I would like to read the first one again, like just quoting you, if that's okay. You said the Mandukya Upanishads openly discussed the meaning of Om. After the sound of Om was heard publicly, it became the most sacred mantra for Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and Zoroastrianism. The sound of Om has always been a part of the yogic tradition. Yogis being rebellious and at times going against the rules of the Brahmin class. And it has now been incorporated in what some refer to as a new age movement in modern times. I loved this history. Can you talk a little bit about how this universalized something that was held within closed doors? And how it went into universal adoption a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So this is this is you know when we talk about um, Om and this idea of this sacred utterance, and because that's the way it's described as a sacred uttering, because Om isn't a word, right? It, it, it's not a word. It's 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 a it's a sound. Um, what we know from the early Vedic period is is that it was never chanted like like when I go into my studio and I say, okay, everybody, we're gonna chant on three times together and just kind of set the mood of the class. It was never done like that. Like um, if I had to deal with one of the seven <laughs> rishis, you know, the Sapta rishis, if, if, if a shista was with me, he would go, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so he, it was actually uh, not, chanted aloud for a long time. It was only an internal vibration. And then it became a mantra that you would initiate with. So in other words, if you were from the Brahmin class, you would initiate a new priest with Om. Like then you would, and you would tell them all of a sudden, okay, now this is, this is everything. Everything that you're doing in the Yug Yug and the Vedic ceremony is really connecting to this uh, pranava, this, this, this life force that's, and we can't tell the common people about this. Don't tell them because they're not ready for it. Over time during the Upanishad period, and we have to remember the Upanishads are trying to explain the Vedas, people started asking questions like, and the Manduka Upanishads really breaks down this idea of own and really starts to see the benefit of everybody having the ability to connect to that internal sound within them. Mm. And in a way, that kind of starts the whole rebellious yogi movement, which is that, you know, I, I can connect. I think, by the way, when you say the rebellious yogi movement, are you talking about the beginning of Ashtanga in the U.S. or are you talking about elsewhere? In no, I'm talking about ancient, ancient history. I mean, we have to remember that yogis, the original yogis, we can look back and we can find um, depictions and descriptions of the original first yogis that were starting to take on these very esoteric practices, practice them in isolation, uh, practice them out of the orthodoxy movement as they were considered demons, they were considered witches, they were considered vampires, they were considered people who could come into your village and sweep your children up and take them away and um, you know, mislead them. 
And so people were fearful of this group of yoga practitioners that were practicing outside of normal orthodoxy. Um, finally, what happened was, is it became so popular that, that orthodoxy had to embrace these practitioners. They had to, and you know, when we, we, you know, when you, we think like orthodoxy, about- Orthodoxy, you mean temples? Are you talking, who are you calling orthodoxy by the way? Like priests- What would, what would be considered uh, Sunatha uh, Dharma or what we call Hinduism, Vedic tradition. The okay. Vedic, the Vedic tradition of like, you know, two, three thousand years ago. And so we see this with, we see this being brought in through the stories of Shiva, who is ID yogi. He's the first yogi, but he's a wild man. He's out on the fringes of society. He's ostracized. And over time, he goes from kind of like heathen to being, uh, ID, you know, uh, to being Shankaria, uh, you know, he becomes, Shankara, yeah. Shankara. he becomes the, the great teacher. He becomes the father. He becomes, he becomes, the yogi becomes a, 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 a citizen that is, is upstanding. Yeah. It's this, so you have the two identities of this yoga deity of being the wild man, uncouth, and then you have him being the high order renunciate and the ultimate yes. yogi in that sense, right? And yeah. that's what that story is about. That's how that transition happens. It's it's yoga being going from a place of it's the kind of thing that the hippies do and the people who are outside of society to yoga being embraced by uh, the general population and the priestly class and realizing that there's great benefits in this. And um, so OM, as, mm. as that's embraced, this vibrational sound of OM becomes very common. Mm. It's, 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 you know, it's written in front of other mantras. It's chanted um, aloud publicly. It's chant. It's 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 people start painting its symbol. Um, you know, it's it's very funny. Right now, we're going through a period, especially with a lot of the uh, the uh, left wing extremists in yoga. I'm going to say, you know, that they're. Oh, here we go, Austin. Don't get us into trouble. I'm not going to get us in trouble, but they're very concerned about like, like namaste and people saying namaste and when it's good to say namaste and when it's bad to say namaste. Namaste, you, you really don't see it written down until the Puranic period where you have mantras to specific deities, you know, where the, it's namas, namaste, da, 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 you know. And it, you see it a lot. So it's a, it's, it's a very tantric term, namaste. Mm -hmm. um, but om is probably far more appropriated and misused in modern yoga culture than namaste ever will be. Mm -hmm. And if you went back and you asked um, the Sapta Rishis or Adi Shankaracharya or Swami Vivekananda, which one should we be more concerned about and how we're exploring and using? They would say, Om. You know, you should make sure that if, if you're practicing this practice of chanting Om, that you're applying it in the right manner. So I, it's really interesting. And I, it, what it's reminding me of, and it's not very dissimilar from what you were trying to say in the beginning of the kind of music you won't even play in a class, which is that acknowledge the sanctity of the experience when you show up. It is almost like, I don't like the word religious, but you understand what I'm saying. It is spiritual. A spiritual it's a spiritual yeah. meditation through motion on the mat when you show up to class. Yes. So set the space and set internal and external. The yes. Studio and the, the classroom and the internal classroom, if you will set that appropriately such that it could lend itself to the full devotion to the sanctity of that moment. And I, when I use the word devotion, I don't mean this religiously at all, because you know that I'm not, uh, I'm not coming from that standpoint. So I like what you said. 
Which then brings me to the second question, and this again you wrote in your newsletter, which is on the symbol itself, and you already referenced a symbol. Do you want to talk a little bit about the symbology of Om as it is written, the three curves and the semicircle and a dot, and what does that mean? Sure. So, um, so one of the one of the most powerful ideas of of that shape is that it represents each one of those sounds, ah, ooh, mm, and that moment of silence, that little dot is that moment of silence. So it's, it, it, it's one, of the, one of the best um, descriptions of it is the idea of the states of consciousness. The big shape is seen as your waking state where most of us experience our hours of the day. Then the little curve that comes off of the center of that kind of three-like shape is seen as the dream state. And they're connected to each other. There's those two shapes are connected. So that three and that little tail coming off the three are connected because as people started analyzing consciousness, they said, look, I don't know whether the dream state is real or the waking state is real. You know, I just had a dream where I felt like I was falling from the sky and it felt real. And I woke up and now this is real. So one of the, one of the things is that, you know, ancient yogi said, well, maybe neither one of those two things are real. Maybe the waking state and maybe the dream state is just completely an illusion. And maybe there's something beyond the waking and the dream state. So then you have the little curve and they said, oh, well, that's deep sleep. That's, that's the least amount of time, but we don't know what happens in deep sleep. In other words, and, and, and this is very true scientifically today. Scientists are still studying deep sleep. They're still studying like why you need deep sleep, how it affects it, how it affects people when they don't have deep sleep and why it affects them so badly when they don't get a chance to go into deep sleep. This is where the eyes are not moving back and forth in, in a dream state. And the ancient yogi said, well, this is the moment of time where the soul reunites with the energy of the universe. And mm. it, it goes back to the source. Mm. And you, that's why if you don't have this, you kind of go mad, you kind of go nuts. And so then there's that little dot above that curve, which is that moment of reintegration, that moment of yoga. And it's separated from the rest of the symbols. It's floating on its own, both the, 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 the uh, deep sleep and the tariya or that the bindu, the, the point is separate. Mm. Um, so that is, is what that symbol actually means, is that mm -hmm. actually is, it's, it's, it's a roadmap on how to get from subject to unite with object. An object being infinite consciousness. Absolute consciousness. Absolute. Yeah, consciousness. How, how, how consciousness connects to super consciousness. Love that. Now, so, I want to, go on, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So OM is really a mantra that is trying to get us to constantly remember to connect to super consciousness. I love that. Do you want to talk a little bit about the what you wrote about the integration of Om and how Krishna uses it in the Bhagavad Gita? Sure. The, like the, so, this is one of the things that also, like as I kept studying, like you realize that this idea of nada, this idea of of internal sound is is being expressed in all of the shastras. Shastras are any of um, the manuals on yoga. And I'm considering uh, Bhagavad Gita a, a Shastra because Krishna explains to Arjuna the process of being a yogi and practicing yoga. 
He, he gives him like, this is what you do first. This is what you do second. This is what you do third. This is what you have to do. So is, so is Hatha Yoga Pradipika. So is um, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So is um, the Shiva Sutras. They are all Shastras. So all of them, all four of those texts, and those are the texts that I draw from um, in my tradition that I was brought um, up in, they did not focus on the Shiva Sutras, which is um, the core teachings for Kashmir Shaivism. Um, I have, I feel like that they're incredibly important to draw from mm. for any contemporary yoga practitioner that is interested in these deeper esoteric ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so all four of these texts, they talk about the pranava. That is how uh, Krishna describes it. And that's how um, uh, Patanjali describes Om. Mm -hmm. He calls it the pranava. Um, in Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is a later text, and Shiva Shastras, with, uh, Sh the Shiva Sutras, which is a later text, they're both described as the Nada. Mm. So you see a you see a slight switching of of terms. But Krishna says, "I am Om. I am the Pranava. Mm. I, I, when you chant the Pranava, you are chanting my name." Mm. But Tanjali says, um, by repetition of the pranava, you understand the pranava. Mm. So he's informing you to continually to chant it. Uh, one of the, one of the, I'll read a, over, not too far from what we're focusing on in this ex exploration, um, Hatha Yoga Pradipika in uh Sloka, I think it's 97, says, hearing the nada, the mind, which is like a serpent within, becomes captivated and all else stops moving. So it's very interesting because Hatha Yoga Pradipika describes it almost like a snake charmer with a basket and a snake in the basket that they you hear the nada and it it mesmerizes the snake and the snake becomes still and, and listens to the sound of the flute, right? Like a snake charmer. So they, 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 they bring in this wonderful image. Mm, of, that's uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, and then in uh, the Shiva Sutras, uh, it basically says that, you know, Shiva is the Nada. Shiva is Nada that when you can hear the nada and you can connect with the nada, you are connected to the higher consciousness. I love this. And this kind of segues into perhaps the last question I have for you today, which is you've just beautifully described the origin story that comes from India in many ways, <laughs> but also in your exploration of the month, you talked a little bit more about the big bang and the, the role of sound, the great yeah. type organ you called it. Um, I'm going to just read three sentences and I would love for you to kind of expand upon it because to me that seems like a beautiful cross-cultural bridge, if you will. Yeah. That has had its precedent here as well. You've, you wrote, modern science has determined that the universe was created by sound vibration. In recent years, science has described the creation of the universe and its sound as a great pipe organ, expanding and contracting. This contraction formed planets, stars, and galaxies. Therefore, all beings, great and small, are created from the sound vibration. Humans have the capability of representing everything in the universe with words and also with sound vibrations. Deeper insight into this mystic sound, Om, reveals that it's composed of four sounds composed into one. But I wanted to go back to the bit about the Big Bang. Right. If you want to, because I, th I thought that it would be a nice way for us to go. We've, we've traveled to India. We've traveled to Kashmir Shaivism and now we are back here in this Western world, which is where you and I live and practice. And, and, this, and so, you know, we, 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 um, we forget that, uh, that uh, in really in, in uh, the text of, 
of Judaism, which is the Old Testament, that um, God actually creates through sound also. He kind of steps into nothingness and somehow creates vibration that creates other things, right? So it is there. And then in the Old Testament, it says, uh, first there was the word and the word was God. So first there was sound vibration and sound vibration is God. That's how you would, you would, or, or is divine, or is the giver of life or however you want to put it. So it, it already says that in Old Testament, um, then as we move into a scientific age, we start to understand that, that, you know, what must have existed before there was a universe was a vacuum. And somehow that vacuum created this explosion and through that explosion created sound. Mm. And then that sound is ripple, rippling outward, creating from its original point. Um, now, that, that idea seemed kind of far-fetched until I think it was in 90, it was in 98 or 99. NASA actually was able to track the radio waves from the Big Bang on the outer edges of space. And they, um, in National Geographic, they actually posted a, a soundbite of what NASA had analyzed the vibration and what it sound, must sound like. Because they couldn't record it, but they were able to pick up the radio waves and then they were able to put those through a computer and come up with what they thought that sound sounded like. And so that sound vibration is still stretching outward and what it touches, it's still creating new universes. It's still creating new, um, new planets and new stars. And it sounds kind of like a hissing sound of Ujjayi. This kind of... Oh, beautiful. So it doesn't sound like ah o oh, um. Mm. It's not that. It's not that Chris. It's not that precise. But it's this kind of hissing, kind of almost like Darth Vader's breath, which is what you're told to do in a yoga class. Which is then in Hatha Yoga Pradipika said the ujjayi is the sound of the nada. Mm. It's the sound of the nada. It's the sound of the pranava, um, the creation. So I find that really super interesting that there's this connection scientifically mm. with vibrational sound and what people were talking about 5,000 years ago mm. without any kind of real scientific knowledge. Mm. That, there's, that, that, that you can see these parallels of theory and idea that are... Um, are running through both a scientific understanding of, of sound and vibration and the, the esoteric and spiritual. Uh, this is beautiful. This has been a terrific and enriching conversation. And if, if you, unless you had something else that you wanted to say, and by the way, I want to correct myself because you said Brahman and the Saraswati and I called it, I re I misheard and I said Raman, uh, Ramana Maharishi. So, I stand corrected that you were quoting Brahman and the Saraswati the whole time. But, yeah, and, uh, we, and we talked a lot about Yogeshri Sudarshan Kanan today, who is who's my teacher. I should also just say that if you want to uh, connect to him or his teachings, um, infinitewings.in.india is his uh, website. And, and each week he does do a Bhagavad Gita study that's on YouTube. And it's Yoga Sri Sudarshan Kanan. So I love it. And I, I can't wait for the next time when we have him in the studio again. And I hope, you know, I yeah. can benefit. Like, I mean, his power, his, the power of the sound vibrations and the meditation that he has led us through multiple times. It's put me, it's knocked me out sometimes. Yeah. 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 Right. Like it goes into yeah, deep concentration. 
This was a terrific, terrific, terrific conversation, Austin. I, as always, you know, you've inspired me, uh, and I'm going to quote you one last time. Okay. And you've inspired me to go deeper into thinking about how, in our all ve- oh, our very noisy modern world, are we able to connect? Are we able to connect to this primal sound? And um, this gives me a beautiful prompt for reflection as I take this with me. Right. on a little flight to India and um, and as I continue to practice yoga with you and the teachers virtually. It will be exciting. I think about Om, I'm actually probably going to put more intention into how, how I chant it. Yeah, I think that and I think that that's and you know and I'm and like I said I'm I I'm I'm guilty of probably mischanting Om many a times, but it's something that if we if we just explore on a deeper level um, you know, we'll have a better understanding of it and uh, not just use it like, a, oh, yeah, let's just all tune in with each other or let's harmonize so we can, you know, chant the next thing. But go a little deeper into it and, um, and, and, and then also explore it on a unstruck level of, yeah. of sitting in deep meditation and trying to hear it. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. I've really enjoyed this. I did too. Have a safe trip. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I I, I can't wait to see your next exploration of the month. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow us at Urban Sadhu Jersey City on Instagram, or you can even take yoga classes with us virtually at U.S. Yoga Live. That's U-S-Y-O-G-A-L-I-V-E dot com. Thank you.